Well, hello everyone. Welcome to a new chapter. Uh, we are going to be starting chapter 23 here. It'll be a two-part lecture. Uh, what we're going to be looking at with respiratory, uh, kind of starting off with anatomy. Then we're going to go through and look at some of the physiology, look at a lot of how we regulate breathing, uh, how we transport gases, uh, things like that. So as we go to look at this, let's start out by just reminding ourselves, hey, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible then suddenly you're doing the impossible. So what we want to start off with is, is as always, now, uh, normally in my classes, uh, this will be true only for the online uh, uh, associated to that we can't do on-site tests, but if you're listening to this in a semester that we're not doing social distancing for COVID-19, uh, then disregard this uh, because I'll probably be reusing this lecture for uh, this coming fall. But this spring semester, spring 2020, if you're listening to this, remember I'm not going to be testing on every objective because I've got to do uh, a short answer uh, and um, a written response exams, uh, which will be a little different. But um, for those of you guys, if you're listening to this uh, any semester outside of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, then we'll be dealing with it differently. So uh, we'll be testing on each objective then. So, uh, But I have to adjust my exam. So we all know that now. So let's take a look at first off the six things that I want to make sure we understand that the respiratory system does. And the first thing we're going to talk about is that it provides area for gas exchange between your air and circulatory system. Now let's talk very briefly about that. What's going to happen is in your lungs uh, you are going to see these little pockets kind of like balloons that would be located inside there. And what's going to happen is that your blood vessels will maintain an incredibly close proximity to these. I mean, incredibly close. They actually, we're going to learn they share the same basement membrane. Uh, but these blood vessels here are going to share, uh, uh, be very close to each other. So this way, when the air that you breathe, when air comes in and enters these areas, this oxygen, this air can enter in the blood and gases we need to remove from the blood can go into the lungs. So we have a lot of this. It is a huge amount of surface area. Um, so there is a lot of surface area here involved in trying to uh, provide an area between air and a circulatory system. We also are moving air in and out of the exchange surfaces of the lungs, as you can see there. I did both of those. We also protect respiratory surfaces from dehydration, temperature changes, and infections. We'll talk about how we do that with mucous membranes, um, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and things like that. We also produce sounds for speaking, so if we want to groan, uh, when we find out we have to do everything online, or if we're going to uh, talk to each other. And then also uh, olfactory information. When you breathe, you're also getting your CNS, some olfactory information, but also the lungs. And this is something that a lot of the lists will not include, but I always add. Now, I always add a sixth thing. And you're like, well, of course, leopard's always going to add one extra function that nobody else wants to seem to talk about. But I think it's incredibly important that you guys understand that the respiratory system controls the pH. It's one of the important systems to regulate the blood's pH. We are going to talk about that. I hope you guys understand it. But it'd be something big we got to talk about. So as we go through this, and right now, COVID-19 is a big thing that people are talking about. We know that COVID-19 can infect the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. So what do we mean by the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system? Well, the upper respiratory system is basically everything above the larynx. And everything below the larynx is your lower respiratory system. So your upper respiratory system is the portion that filters and humidifies the air. That's things like your nose, your nasal cavity, your paranasal sinuses, and your pharynx. So simply put, it's everything above the larynx that's part of your respiratory system. So its job there is to help get the air conducted 
to the exchange surfaces. It humidifies, it filters. So for example, if you have a pollen grain in the air that you breathe or a bacterial cell in the air that you breathe or a viral particle like COVID-19 virus that somebody had sneezed and you breathe it in, well, potentially we can filter that out using nose hairs and mucus, things like that, and maybe prevent it from infecting us. Um, or prevent the allergens from getting in. We talk about that a little bit with allergens and things. Uh, we talk about how mucous membranes play a role uh, in, in immunity. Now, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, that uh, this stuff uh, is, it not, is it's warming and humidifying it so the air, the lungs don't dry out. The, the air doesn't dry out our lungs. So it's basically conditioning the air so that it is going to aid in us uh, having effective gas exchange in the lower respiratory surface. The conducting and change surfaces below the larynx, from larynx down. So larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, and the lungs, which contain a lot of this, are all part of that. Now, I oftentimes would always like to ask which of these is part of upper respiratory, which of these is part of the lower respiratory on my... Uh, exams, but uh, so now what we will see is parts of the respiratory system. Most uh, we have what's called a respiratory mucosa. Remember, a mucosa is a mucous membrane. We're going to have an epithelium, and we're going to have a mucous lining. Now, not only that, but there's going to be some connective tissues like lamina propria uh, that's going to be there. We know that from histology section, chapter four, uh, lab one. Uh, so our very first lab exam from AMP1. So uh, the lamina propria, that's just your underlying areolar connective tissues that attach the epithelium. Now the epithelium can be different places in the nasal cavity and in parts of your uh, lower respiratory tract like your trachea, there is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And that's what we have depicted here. Remember, this is pseudostratified because though it has appears to have layers, you have cells that touch the bottom and the top. So this is not something that a truly stratified epithelium can do. And But there are also cilia. So your nasal cavities have this pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And then, uh, now your pharynx is mostly stratified squamous and stratified columnar, very protective thick layers. Your lower respiratory tract epithelium, the mucosa, is pseudostratified as well. And then what you have is the alveoli are composed epithelial-wise uh, respiratory mucosa membranes are simple squamous epithelium. Okay, these are the, now there's other tissues involved, of course. Now this mucus, what's interesting about your cilia is it kind of makes a mucus escalator. Um, so if you were to get on an escalator and ride up the escalator, all the cilia whip in one direction. As they do, they move, move the mucus. And here we might have uh, a pollen grain that got stuck in it. And you can cough it out and get rid of it uh, out of the mucus. And the mucus made by your goblet cells here. Goblet cells never make mucus called goblet cells. They act, the mucus uh, kind of acts like flypaper, trapping debris. The debris would be like maybe dust, uh, pollen, uh, other things that you breathe in, smoke, something that you breathe in that is particulate matter that you don't want to get down into the lungs and this tries to protect it. I remember when I was in college and we were discussing the very first gene therapies and I was reading the paper on it. This was, was an upper division uh, undergraduate right before I started graduate school. And we were looking at a paper and people were trying to treat um, as an early gene therapy um, cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is a mutation that messes with the absorption of certain ions and fluids and stuff from mucus especially in the airways and also reabsorbing uh, ions and um, uh, water in the skin with the sweat glands so you end up with salty skin and you end up with very mucus that's overproduct very gets very thick mucus that's hard to breathe through and uh, so 
what they were doing was we were talking about that that they were trying to breathe it in. They were trying to aerosol it uh, by an inhaler, like an, like you would with inhaled uh, albuterol sulfate. And uh, it turns out this pseudostarf acetylated chlorine epithelium was so good at its job, it actually prevented this delivery route for that. Um, we were they were hoping to get it delivered the correct genes. To the areas, and you know, this would be surely an easy route to deliver. Turns out it was not, and I haven't seen any more changes done there. Now you're uh, so the cilia sweep it up, kind of like a mucus escalator, where the goblet cells make the mucus that is like flypaper trapping in debris, and you can cough that out and get rid of it. My my dog is sitting here; she's demanding attention and pets, so I have to pet her for a minute. Come here, Myra. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, the wonderful thing about being at home <laughs> is is we have lovey dogs. So uh, my my number one companion. So nasal cavity. Uh, we're going to see the external nares at your nostrils. Uh, behind that is a flexible space here called the um, vestibule. And now all of this is your nasal cavity right here, from the cone to the nostrils. This is all nasal cavity. The brassi, that is your hairs, they help remove particles. They'll get uh, the brassi, nose hairs, will get mucus on them, and then a particle like a pollen grain or a bacterial cell, viral cell, rhinovirus, another strain of coronavirus. Actually, a lot of some head colds are caused by coronaviruses. Um, and they get in and uh, uh, they form a clump. The antibodies found in the mucus will clump. And a clump of mucus... Whoa, sorry about that, guys. It was an email. A clump of mucus that has that in there, we call that a booger. So, you know, there you go. It gets stuck on your hairs. Uh, now, there is a hard palate. The hard palate here is bone. It's made of the maxillary and palatine bone. Um, we'll talk more about that in the digestive tract um, and in lab and stuff. The conchi are these three lumps, the superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi. Um, and there are the meatuses between each of these that they have. And the cone or internal nares. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I had to go and um, uh, shut down email for a minute. I was just getting these loud email alerts. So the cone, that is from the nasal cavity down into your pharynx. So as we go from the nasal cavity, now we're in the pharynx down here. The pharynx has three divisions. Behind the cone and right here to the end of the salt palate, you have the division called the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx is the superior most part of the pharynx. Uh, pharynx has three anatomical divisions, so the soft palate would be included in that as it goes right here to the end of it. And that's the back of the roof of the mouth. There is the opening for the auditory tube or eustachian tube or pharyngotympanic tube to go from the pharynx to your middle ear, specifically to the tympanic cavity. And you also will find your pharyngeal tonsil or adenoid back here as well. Now, as we go from here down, from here to the base of the tongue, to the base of the tongue, from the soft palate to base of the tongue is the oropharynx. Oropharynx is the middle section. Associated to that is the hyoid, going up at an angle, the hyoid. It is there for speech. Falsies is the opening to the back of the throat, so the gap that you would see here is your falsies. Uh, now, it is important. I'm going to show you something why it is important that you learn these. Uh, you do need to know this. You guys will be assessing patients. You'll be going in when you get ready to intubate, and you have a patient crashing, and you guys are they're going to say, well, patient has an M score, da-da-da. So you need to understand uh, these structures like uh, the uh, uvula, the falsies, things like that, the hard palate, soft palate, especially the soft palate, uvula, falsies, looking through the throat, how much of that is visible. If you could see it all, it's a very low uh, malampati score. If it's very uh, a high score, means you don't see much. It's going to be more difficult to intubate, that kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly in a minute. 
The uvula is the hanging down thing in the back of the throat, as I always like to call it. It's a little hanging down thing. This guy here assists in speech. It also is involved in your gag reflex, by the way. That's why I always like to say is that if you touch this, you can taste all the foods you've eaten in the last 12 hours. Um, yeah, you can taste everything you've eaten in the last 12 hours if you touch that because you'll vomit. <laughs> so, okay. And then uh, as we go down, we have our laryngopharynx. And laryngopharynx is very important because this is the junction to go from the esophagus food tube to the trachea, the air tube, the breathing tube. And these two tubes, if they are, they have a junction, and it goes in the hyoid down. Now, the thing about this is, is you could get aspirate and have food and drink go down the lung. Um, or when somebody intubates, let's say they go in and intubate. If they put it down this way, you're going to inflate the stomach, and you're going to see the abdomen rise and fall. That is not going to help. You need to go into here to get to the lungs to fill up with air. And you want to see the chest rising and falling. And this will happen. You will see this in healthcare if you haven't already. Somebody, when they innovate, doing it wrong. All right. So uh, this part goes, and I will ask you guys questions about, like, you know, where's... I always like to ask where these things go. Now, the larynx... We call this your voice box. It begins at C4 to C6. C4 to C6 is where the larynx sits. C4, because the larynx is your voice box, produces your sound. Imagine, so C4 is easy to remember because you might have an explosive voice. I've been told I'm loud, apparently. <laughs> Some of you guys who have me for class know. Uh, it, it was joked about that I was so loud that our 94-year-old uh, chemistry professor with hearing aids has to come in to, from another classroom and tell me to keep it down because they can't, his students can't hear him through, to, through a wall. So uh, for, for me, I'm through, talking through the wall and I'm louder than him, apparently. Now, your C4 to C6 is where the larynx sits. The glottis is the opening, and that's where air from the pharynx goes into the larynx. Um, so it's the gap located between your um, uh, vocal cords, basically. Now your glottis, uh, we have cartilages, two kinds of cartilages. You have what's called large unpaired cartilages. These are like your epiglottis that helps cover glottis when you swallow, helps prevent food from aspirating. Um, or drink. Uh, thyroid cartilages, it's the front wall of the larynx, uh, it, very U-shaped like a shield, and it has a sticking out part, a laryngeal prominence, which we commonly call the Adam's apple. Uh, the cricoid cartilage is the inferior or bottom wall of larynx. Uh, now there are two small cartilages that open and close the glottis to produce sound. They are what actually pulls to tighten the vocal cords, or relaxes to loosen the vocal cords. It's called the arytenoid and corniculate cartilages. Now the cuneiforms, I just want to tell you that they are a small paired cartilage. Other than that, you don't have to know anything about functionalities at this level. Vocal folds, they are very elastic. Our vocal cords, our true vocal folds, these are our vocal cords, very elastic, very stretchy. The vestibular folds, also called ventricular folds, these guys are what prevents anything that you swallow, like uh, chunks of food that you inhale, uh, might uh, go into the glottis, protect your vo vocal cords. These guys are what's there to protect. Now here are Chad, uh, this guy, I, I imagine his name is Chad, is here to show us all of his larynx there. So. Um, and you'll notice a few things. I'm not going to sit and point out everything. I'll do that in lab. Uh, but uh, And you could actually see the um, cuneiform cartilages here and here uh, as well. The corniculate and retinoid uh, are not really well seen here. Um, so, okay. Sorry, my other dog's starting to bark, which means Myra may bark. Uh, I've got Myra in here. I mean, she's daddy's girl. She likes to hang out with daddy. Uh, I'm going to have to pause and let her out. 
Sorry about that, guys. I had to go let the dog out. Okay, so the trachea is said C6 to, uh, to T5. So uh, remember here, as we saw, your larynx. Sorry, I clicked something I shouldn't have. The larynx was C4 to C6 where the larynx sits. Now the airway is the trachea. It's C6 to T5. C6 to T5. Now the tracheal cartilage sits at about, uh, it has about 15 to 20 of these. They're shaped like the letter C wrapping around the front to stiffen the wall to allow the uh, trachea to stay open. It's kind of like the rings in a vacuum cleaner hose. Without them, when you turn the vacuum cleaner on, it would have uh, collapsed the hose. Now the bronchial tree comes off and it uh, branches and it begins to branch off the trachea. There's bronchi and bronchioles. The first bronchi is the primary. Now there is a right one and a left one. There's a right primary bronchi and a left primary bronchi. The carina is inside where the right and left bronchi separate. Uh, there's an internal ridge that kind of helps separate those called the carina. Now, after this, you have what's called the secondary bronchi. Secondary bronchi branch off the primary. We call them lobar bronchi. Why? Because there is one for each lobe. You will find one secondary bronchus or bronchi for every lobe of the lung. Tertiary bronchi, they branch off. We call them segmental bronchi. Uh, they go on to what's called lung segments, bronchial pulmonary segments. If you guys are looking ever at an image that has, um, I'll kind of show you what I mean by that. Uh, just sometimes I like to share these things when I'm doing my lectures is uh, bronchial pulmonary segments and these segments you will see on the models you notice that all the bronchial pulmonary or uh, segmental bronchi tertiary bronchi they are all color coded well, they're color-coded to the bronchial pulmonary segments. So here's each one of these segmental bronchi, and here's each segment that goes that correspond. Okay, so anatomically, that's what's going on. That's why they're called segmental. Uh, now, after the tertiary bronchi, you go into the bronchioles. The bronchioles are unique in the fact that they do not have cartilages on them. So they're very sensitive to bronchial spasms. They're very sensitive to uh, uh, inflammation, things like that. Then we're going to go into what's called an alveolar duct. Now, this is something where I add some extra details because I do want to make sure students understand these things as you're going in. You're going to talk about alveolar ducts and things when you guys get into healthcare. Um, is that with the alveoli, if this was the alveoli, this is the duct, alveolar duct. Okay, that's the alveolar duct. So the duct comes into the alveolar sac itself. Now, a sac is collections of alveoli. So these alveolar ducts go into the alveolar sacs, and then the alveolar sacs, uh, collections of alveoli, and the alveoli is where gas exchanges. Okay? Uh, and then, uh, so you can actually see. Now, something I do want to mention is the right primary bronchus you notice has less of a steep curve to it. It doesn't bend as much. And it's usually more likely inhaled objects go here. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to see is here's also the alveolar ducts. Um, you can see where do they have a gun there where they label the alveolar duct to the alveolar sac. Okay, now, the respiratory membrane. Now, this is something important that we're going to talk about is the area that we breathe. And here with an alveoli, let's say that I've got an alveoli, a single alveoli, 
they are going to be lined and I'm just going to use this nice pretty aqua color here and they are going to have pneumocytes now there's going to be two pneumocytes there's going to be a type 1 and a type 2 now I'm going to have the type 1 pneumocyte here and the type 1, that's the thin membrane for gas exchange. That'd be your type 1 pneumocyte. I'm going to come in with this pretty uh, lime green here. And I'm going to make him look like that. And that's going to be a type 2 pneumocyte. Now what type 2 pneumocytes do? is they secrete a lipidy rich material that is going to help coat the type ones okay and I'm going to talk about this they secrete this stuff here this stuff is called surfactant they make surfactant okay so the type 2 pneumocytes produce this surfactant that's going to coat the inside. It's going to reduce. Remember in AMP1, we talked about how water has what is called surface tension to it. And that water has surface tension. And that, that surface tension is basically how hard it is to break the surface of water. Um, well, this reduces that surface tension. Okay, That's the function of that, is to reduce the surface tension. Okay, now uh, what we do is uh, with that, the epithelium has two types of cells. Type 1, that's the thin membrane for gas exchange. That's simple squamous. Uh, type 2, these produce surfactant. It's very lipidy rich. It's also very protein rich, very slippery. It helps basically keep your alveoli open. It helps reduce surface tension, helps in gas exchange. There are types of respiratory distress caused by these malfunctioning, so it is very important that we understand them. Uh, there is also going to be an endothelium of an adjacent capillary that we got to talk about. Now, before I do that though, what I'm going to do, and uh, so here we have the bottom of that cell. The black line here is going to reference something very interesting. Uh, this black line is going to be representing the basement membrane or basal lamina. Okay, basal lamina. And this basal lamina that it's going to have here is going to actually be shared with the endothelium of the capillary bed. Now I was mentioning that the endothelium of the capillary beds are very close proximity. Okay, so we have that uh, going on here as well. Now I'm going to complete the drawing just by going around and putting the rest of the capillary on here. Um, sorry, it looks crappy. It's very hard for me to draw like this, uh, but this is what I have left. This is what I have to do. Um, so there is a fill, uh, a shared endothelium. Okay, the endothelium here is shared uh, or with the basal lamina uh, that shares it with the type 1 pneumocytes. The type 1 pneumocytes, the simple squamous uh, for the alveoli, shares a membrane, shares a basal lamina with the endothelium of the capillary that surrounds each alveolus. Okay, so uh, now that we understand the respiratory membrane and its basic structures, uh, here you can see it. Here uh, you have your uh, 
your type 2 pneumocyte, your type 1 pneumocytes, uh, capillaries uh, are here in close, close proximity. I'm sorry if you can hear the dogs barking. Um, this is the annoying thing about having to do this at home. They cannot be quiet. Um, you have the endotheme of the capillary. You have a fused basement membrane and the endothelium here and that surfactant remember covers it okay and this is what i was basically doing is if you take this and zoom in on it that's what you're seeing there okay and i hope that makes sense what i was drawing for the basement membrane okay now the lungs the lungs are surrounded by a pleura um and i apologize if you can hear our dogs barking they're crazy uh normally what happens is when i'm at home uh they're gonna people right now there's uh, all the kids in the neighborhood are home all the teenagers and they're just walking up and down and running around in the neighborhood because they're bored <laughs> so the uh so it's kind of difficult right now but what i'm going to do is i want to draw a very quick sketch of a long very quick and simple lung sketch. And we're going to talk about the pleura here. And I'm just going to do this one here. Now, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, let me pick green. Remember, the pleura is a serous membrane. Given that, it is double-lined sealed membrane. Okay? Now, I'm trying to make it as close as possible to that. Okay. Now, I'm going to switch to purple. All right. And there are two layers around the lung of this. Now, the outermost layer is the parietal layer. Pa 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 ra ra a a a i a a a a to pa ra a to pa pa ra a a i a ta a ta to pa ra a a to pa ra a to. So you got to do it like bad romance, and you guys will be able to spell it very easily then. So you like only Lefford would do that. And then our visceral layer, and our visceral layer. Uh, and parietal layer of those two. Okay, there is a visceral layer and a parietal layer of that. The pleural cavities are the space the lung sits, the cavities surrounding the lungs. The lungs are fitting in the pleural cavities. Now, there is a hilum, that is the space where all the blood vessels, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, the bronchi, uh, and the uh, um, pulmonary nerves come in. Uh, now, there are two lungs, a right lung and a left lung. Now, the right lung has three lobes. Since it has three lobes, it has three secondary bronchi. The left lung has two lobes, and that means it has only two secondary bronchi. Now, the left lung is smaller because the heart's position. Now, the right lung has two fissures separating the two lobes. The oblique fissure separates the inferior lobe from the other two. The horizontal separates the superior lobe from the middle lobe. Now, the left lung also has a cardiac notch, allowing for the position of the heart, and this should not have been boldened here, but somebody unbold that and hit enter and save that real quick. Uh, so the left lung has a cardiac notch. Uh, the there are two lobes and there's only a low oblique fissure separating the superior and inferior lobe of the lung. Now I do need to kind of add maybe a little bit more details about the lobes, uh, just a little bit. I do that more in the lab in anatomy, but all right. So guys, um, that really concludes it for the anatomy portion. Now as you'll see, this is a about a 45 slide lecture. So what I'm going to kind of do is be focusing on the physiology in the next lecture. So I'm actually going to stop here and do part two. Uh, but now that we're into the out of the anatomy part, I felt like that's a great place to stop. Then we'll pick up with the physiology part in part two. So guys, thank you for watching, and I hope you find this helpful. Please feel free to email me if you have questions.